Towing, Inc. And Mr. Michael Bromowich is and is very welcome, Director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Regulation and Enforcement, previously referred to as MMS, but now reformed. With that, as you saw on the first panel, I would ask all the witnesses to rise and take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Gentlemen, the first panel was one. You are five. I will ask you to please summarize your opening statements and stay within the five minutes for each other's and, and our side. Uh, and I, uh, I apologize for the first panel going long, but hopefully it's set up questions and answers for all of you in the second panel. panel. Mr. Tafaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, Ranking Member Cummings. Appreciate your opp the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, while there have been numerous reviews, reports, and studies completed in, the relation, in relation to the BP oil spill disaster, the reality of the impact continues to unfold, and the intermediate and long-term obstacles and effects are just coming into focus. The experiences and lessons learned through the first year of the oil spill, the remaining years of the oil spill recovery, experiences of those directly and indirectly impacted by this spill are offered as just that, insights. My hope is that the message delivered is not lost in the corporate world of spin marketing or in the spin-off media exposés designed to sensationalize the event and leave the victims and the coast without the attention it is warranted. Insight 1, hold the responsible party accountable. There are a few axioms of our society more basic than the one we learned in some of our earliest social development. If you make a mess, clean it up. As simple as this axiom sounds, there has been an ever-present allowance in this disaster that has allowed BP to make it right on their own terms and not based on the terms of the impacted states, communities, businesses, and individuals. Unlike the natural disasters that we continue to respond to as a nation, this disaster has an identified responsible party. There is no value in talking about the disaster in terms of responsibility if there are loopholes and justifications that allow the agent that created the mess to define the terms of the response. Added to this axiom referenced here is the understood message about the mess versus the mess maker. Somehow we seem to be routed into an ongoing focus of is BP good or bad, or is deep water drilling good or bad, instead of a consistent focus of who is responsible for the mess and has it been cleaned up quickly, comprehensively, and in a way that does not create another mess. The reality is that the value in cleaning up a mess that was created offers as much immunity and positive spin to the mess maker as any spin marketing campaign could accomplish. The second insight I offer is re to remove the response and restoration authority from the responsible party. This insight must not confuse the terms authority and responsibility. The responsible party being responsible should translate into doing what is deemed to be required to complete the actions involved in addressing the environmental, coastal, social, economic, medical, and emotional impacts of the given disaster. Removing the authority to decide what those interventions that shall be required from the responsible party protects the impacted states, communities, businesses, and individuals from further victimization. In an oversimplification il illustration, when we are involved in a car accident, the person who caused the accident doesn't get to dictate how and what treatment or repair is dictated. Insight number three, legislate for the disaster that will happen versus one that has already happened. A critical lesson that continues to face us is the need to address current legislation in a way that transcends the most recent disaster. While the need to know causal information in any disaster is important, the framework of legislation that allows flexibility in accomplishing the overarching mission of effective and expedient response and the ability to require action by a responsible party must be examined. While new legislation will not correct any of the ills of the BP Deepwater Horizon spill, 
We can implement language that authorizes broader oversight and intervention authority, stiffer penalties for a lack of cooperation, including language that revokes a company's ability to operate under other permits if it has not been compliant, while in all terms making sure that production is not mutually exclusive with safety. Unfortunately, we as a collective unit of citizens, government officials, and industry leaders cannot predict the next disaster, but we can predict the, the next response. We can predict the next worst-case scenario and ensure that legislation with the appropriate flexibility and force is enacted to protect the interests of all citizens. And finally, the last insight is to localize the response process to better serve the impacted victims. The shortest distance between two lines is a straight line, or the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. No one argues that, but we continue to set aside this, sci this scientific law as well as, as we develop and address local needs at a, at a nationalized approach. While impacted citizens of St. Bernard Parish continue to have less than 25 percent of their claims settled, the monthly payment to Mr. Feinberg continues unfettered. While I have no problem with, the, with, the, with an honest day's pay for an honest day's work, I do question an assignment of claims processing and the payment thereof without a performance clause in favor of the victims. We were told that claims processed through the Feinberg plan was independent. That is not true. We were told that the claims would be easier to process at the local level in the Feinberg plan. That is not true. We were told that the Feinberg plan had greater flexibility and was implemented to address the victims regardless of the impact to BP. We have found that this is also not true. I have met Mr. Feinberg and have no personal problem with him as an individual. I do not claim to know his business. But I do, uh, I do know that because of the lack of ability to resolve claims at the local level, his program and process has been ineffective. St. Bernard has offered at no cost to the Feinberg plan to assist him in identifying claimants that are likely to be questionable versus those whose local work history supports their need for assistance. A common tenet in the disaster response industry is that disasters are local. This is supported because the impact of disaster is most real for the individuals living or mourning through it. We would ask that the local government and local involvement continue to be involved not only in the compensation process, but equally in the response and restoration phase of all disasters. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts, and thank you for keeping this issue at the forefront of your agenda. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of Florida's 67 counties, and more specifically our coastal communities and counties of Northwest Florida, I would like to thank the Chairman uh, uh, Issa, and the committee members for the opportunity to address the o House Oversight and Government Reform Committee this morning. Before I begin my presentation to the committee, I would also like uh, to take or take the opportunity and tell the Chairman thank you for sending down uh, two great staff members that saw firsthand the things within my community in the State of Florida, Mr. Tyler Glam and Mr. Ryan Hamilton. Their presence uh, provided a special opportunity for our entire community to share their experiences and tell their stories firsthand to members of this committee. I am here today to speak to you about the struggle that the Florida counties and our constituents faced in the days and months following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. It is clear in hindsight that even in the face of these struggles, we cannot ignore the good intentions and Herculean efforts by the Federal and State response teams, even though the response, and even the responsible party that tried to do their best while facing this unique and global tragedy. However, as a lifelong Florida resident and survivor of more than 20 hurricanes, best efforts and good intentions are not enough. We must learn from our mistakes so that the disaster response is not just swift, but clear, organized, and collaborative for the communities impacted. There is no question that Florida has the foremost disaster response team in our country and arguably the world. With the hurricane season the last six months and can boast up to 20 named storms, Florida can ill afford anything but to be the best. Yet in the immediate aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, our expert response teams were forced under, uh, under Oil Pollution Act of 1990 rather than the tried and true Federal Stafford Act. Our traditional emergency management system was turned upside down and on its head, leaving the Florida counties at the mercy of a, United, a, United, excuse me, a unified command structure that was established outside of Florida altogether. For example, 
During the first critical weeks of the oil spill, individuals based in Alabama who had never stepped foot in Gulf County or other panhandle counties of Florida that were using 10-year-old ACP or uh, Area Contingency Plan maps were making final decisions regarding how Gulf beaches and all of Florida's beaches would be protected. Local expertise and resources were ignored as strangers decided whether to place oil protection booms near, near county beaches, inland water bodies, and sensitive environmental resources. To compound matters, communications for unified command was limited and rarely consistent from day to day. Leaving my county and all of Florida counties in the dark and, con and concerned that any preparation and response effort would be too little too late. With little information coming from Unified Command, local communities were forced to expend significant financial resources, gearing up and preparing for potential events that could be quantified or predicted. These financial commitments came, as you well know, at a time when Florida counties and most governments were laying off in employees and facing extreme budget shortfalls due to the economy. Yet it took more than four months to begin uh, seeing reimbursement for the emergency expenditures. Faced with these challenges, our coastal counties themselves, under the umbrella of the Florida Association of Counties, to address a range concern as we evolve to a response to recovery. And while counties consistently met with State and Federal officials, in most instances the role of the local community was minimized. More importantly, in spite of our efforts, recommendations regarding what type of recovery structure would be mess meet our needs and the communities directly impacted were never specifically sought. This story and the experience have produced a short list of priorities that I would like to call lessons learned. I share this with, uh, with you in hopes that Congress will take these concepts, review them, and develop proposals so that any future disasters are operated with clear organization, collaboration, strong communication, and focused on the local community, individuals, and the businesses directly impacted. We strongly encourage Congress to review and evaluate OPA. Florida's emergency response system, which operates under the Stafford Act, doesn't just work, is an example to be followed. Why not take the best response plans and teams in the world and use them as the foundation of our disaster? The Stafford Act works because local communities are the first responders, the State government responding to our local needs, and the Federal government responding to the State needs. OPA failed because it was a top-down approach that looked to the responsible party rather than to utilize local expertise and resource. This lack of collaboration created duplication and triplication of all efforts. In regards to the claims in general, it would be our recommendation that Congress provide greater clarity and direction to the process. Probably the greatest frustration for everyone involved, both private and public, were constant changes in the claims process. There were eight different policies, procedures, processes, and applications within the first two months. The summer was almost over before our businesses and individuals finally had a solid process. As for our public or government claims, it would be our recommendation that costs associated with first responder expenses such as protection, prevention, strategies, mitigation strategies, and cleanup should be clearly laid out similar to the Stafford Act and not held hostage, to the, uh, hostage by the responsible party. In preparation for the next potential event, a separate funding process should be established so state emergency operations and local first responder plans are not abrogated or delayed because of questions of financial capacity or whether the responsible party will approve the specific cost. In addition, loss of revenue claims by public entities should be included in a process that incorporates an independent third party review. The parties should not have leverage over the states and local communities concerning economic issues, determining methodologies for measurement, and potential veto over certain claims. Any independent, unbiased process should be established almost a year before it was completed as instituted by the lost revenue claims. We also ask Congress to establish and approve the Gulf Coast Recovery Fund with 80 percent going to the, uh, directly to the environmental restoration and economic recovery of the Gulf Coast region. I personally support and ask Congress to support the recommendations of Secretary of Navy uh, Mabus' report published in September of last year. Mr. Chairman, like you, we are committed to working with our Federal and State partners, and we appreciate the opportunity to be before you today. Thank you. Mr. Keefe. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of offshore towing and how we have been impacted in the Gulf of Mexico as a result of the BP disaster the moratorium and related issues. Offshore towing is a partnership of three smaller marine towing companies who collectively operate a fleet of seagoing tugboats in the Gulf of Mexico, providing services in the oil and gas sector, primarily towing drilling rigs to and from various locations in shallow water. 
We are located along the Gulf Coast in La Rosa, Louisiana, and collectively employ approximately 110 people. Although the moratorium has been lifted and the shallow water sector was not to be impacted as the deep water sector, substantially negative economic impacts have been felt and economic recovery is more distant now than ever before. This company used to, used to move 25 to 30 rigs a month, and now we move 10 or less due to the lack of drilling permits being issued. On top of that, auto rigs are leaving the Gulf as well due to the challenges with the issuance of drilling permits. We do not have term contracts and work on the job-to-job -job on the spot market. BP will not compensate companies like ours because they claim that our economic losses are a result of the moratorium, not the spill. I was present in Mr. Bromwich's testimony in March before the House Natural Resources Committee and heard his testimony. He testified that he felt as though the government was responsible as well for the blowout, but this administration continues to reflect as much light as they can on BP or anyone else that they can blame. Twenty billion dollars sounds good, but grants us no relief. An unforgiving governmental agency such as the BOMRE do not provide much hope for us when it comes to addressing our economic issues. We have had few layoffs because of this crisis, because we maintained an optimistic view relative to the industry rebounding in a timely fashion. We have used capital blended with lines of credit to offset the shortcomings that normal earnings would support, but even that exercise has its thresholds. The beginning of the tolerance levels that have been established have been met now. Expectations for a timely recovery are lower than ever. Our confidence in this administration, government, and its agencies are not what they used to be, and we do not believe in any reasonable solutions or in our near future. We have recently reduced wages on employees and have started a plan to begin releasing employees. We can no longer afford to subsidize unemployment and must enforce these unpopular but necessary exercises. Our maintenance schedules have also been modified and changed to later dates because the necessity to replace and or overhaul machinery will no longer be necessary due to the lack of use. Factories such as Caterpillar, General Motors, and John Deere, who produce our engines and replacement parts, will begin to be impacted as well. Therefore, states such as Michigan and Illinois will be feeling this slowdown along with the rest of us. There are a variety of different items that could be identified, but this is the biggest example that I could describe. We understand that precious lives were lost and that an environmental disaster that was some years in the making should not be ignored. However, there was a governmental agency that had a hand to play in this along with the others. Environmentally, the American government and several administrations over the past 60 years have ignored our environmental needs in this region. The Louisiana coast, marshes, and wetlands are disappearing at astonishing rates. So our government has ignored more environmental issues, including Macondo, than anyone else. Mr. Bromwich claims to be offended by the term permatorium, but he doesn't understand that millions of people are offended by the actions or lack of actions of this administration, the government, and its agencies. The administration, the government, its agencies, the media, and the press have done a good job of separating the American people by creating political boundaries to satisfy political agendas, when the truth of the matter is that America is more interwoven than what is being given credit for. We need our brothers and sisters in Michigan and Illinois, and they need us. Americans all over this country depend on one another for a variety of different resources. Our leaders should focus on that. This government is so broken and is beginning to virally infect the American people who deserve better. It is our duty, as, it is your duty as stewards of the public to fix this. Please do your best for the American people and put this nation back to work. Thank you again for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Mr. Rusko. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I am pleased to speak with you today about the Department of the Interior's challenges associated with managing Federal oil and gas in the aftermath of the Macondo oil spill. 
Interior leases Federal lands and waters for oil and gas exploration, development, and production. These activities provide a domestic source of energy, create jobs, and raise revenues that are shared between Federal, State, and Tribal governments. Revenue generated from oil and gas on Federal lands and waters is one of the largest non-tax sources of Federal government funds, totaling billions of dollars annually. <clears throat> the deadly explosion on board the Deepwater Horizon and resulting oil spill emphasize the importance of Interior's permitting and inspection processes to ensure operational and environmental safety. As found by the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and offshore drilling, this disaster was a product of several individual missteps and oversights by BP, Halliburton, and Transocean, which government regulators lacked the authority, the necessary resources, and the technical expertise to prevent. In recent years, GAO has evaluated many aspects of Interior's management of Federal oil and gas resources. We have found material weaknesses in three broad areas, and as a result, in 2011, GAO placed Interior's management of Federal oil and gas on the high-risk list. First, Interior has been unable to complete production inspections, maintain reliable royalty and production data, and provide reasonable assurance that the public is receiving its fair share of oil and gas revenues. In recent years, Interior has not consistently met its statutory or agency goals for verifying that companies accurately report volumes of oil and gas produced on Federal leases. Interior has also lacked consistent and reliable data on the production and sale of oil and gas from Federal lands, and has been unable to provide reasonable assurance that it was appropriately assessing and collecting royalties. Secondly, Interior faces longstanding challenges in hiring, training, and retaining staff in key oil and gas inspection and engineering positions. In addition to hampering production verification efforts, these human capital challenges have resulted in delays in issuing leases and caused Interior to be unable to meet its statutory and agency goals for performing safety and environmental inspections of oil and gas facilities. Finally, in May 2010, Secretary Salazar announced plans to reorganize the Minerals Management Service into three bureaus. Under this reorganization, offshore leasing, planning, and permitting will be done in the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Offshore inspections and enforcement by the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement and revenue collection by the newly created Office of Natural Resources Revenue. Organizational transformations are complex endeavors requiring concerted and sustained efforts of management and staff. Interior's reorganization will be challenging because it is happening at a time when the agency is working to implement dozens of recommendations made by GAO, Interior's Inspector General, and other entities, and because Interior is still responding to the after effects of the Macondo oil spill. These efforts include implementing new practices and procedures for planning, permitting, inspections, and enforcement. In addition, Interior has stated that its reorganization will require increased levels of funding, and this will be very difficult to achieve in this time of tight budgets. It is essential that Interior gets this reorganization right. The agency must provide Congress and the public with reasonable assurance that billions of dollars of revenues owed the public are properly assessed and collected, and that oversight of oil and gas activities on Federal lands and waters maintains an appropriate balance between efficiency and timeliness on one hand and protection of the environment and operational safety on the other. While Interior has already come a long way toward implementing organizational change and has responded to many recommendations, it may require congressional attention to fully accomplish its goal of restructuring and improving the management of public oil and gas resources. This ends my oral statement. Thank you. I will be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Bromowicz. Thank you, uh, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I am happy to be here in response to your invitation and to discuss the activities of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. These activities include putting in place strengthened safety measures and regulatory reforms relating to reviewing and approving exploration and development plans and applications for permits to drill. Those measures and the many other steps we have taken over the past year have been part of our response to Deepwater Horizon and its aftermath. But as you know, aside from one grant program, my agency is not directly involved in Gulf Coast recovery efforts, nor do we work with BP 
on its recovery efforts. To the extent that the issues the Committee is exploring today extends beyond my agency's jurisdiction, I will take those questions back to the Department of the Interior uh, to other agencies. At Bomer, we have devoted enormous efforts over the past year to put in place a new and necessary set of rigorous standards for safety and responsibility in our offshore development program. Our aggressive reforms to offshore oil and gas regulation and oversight are the most extensive in the United States history. These reforms strengthen requirements for everything from well design and workplace safety to corporate accountability and are helping to ensure that the U.S. can safely and responsibly expand development of our energy resources. Over the past year, multiple reviews and investigations have produced reports advocating the need for change in our agency. The President's Commission on Deepwater Horizon, the Department of the Interior's Inspector General, the Department's own Safety Oversight Board, and multiple committees of the House and Senate, including this one, all have highlighted the need for reform in the way the Department does business and in the way oil and gas operations are carried out offshore. Many of the recommendations presented in these reports have validated the administrative actions and reforms we have been undertaking at the Department to promote safety and science in offshore oil and gas operations. These changes were necessary to ensure that industry and government work to help prevent an accident like Deepwater Horizon from happening again. We have issued new regulations to bolster safety and to enhance the evaluation and mitigation of environmental risks. Our new drilling safety rule put in place tough new standards for well-designed casing, cementing, and blowout preventers, including the requirement that the drilling process be certified by a professional engineer. Our performance-based SEMS rule requires operators to develop a comprehensive safety and environmental management program that identifies the potential hazards and risk reduction strategies for all phases of activity. BOMER has also issued notices to lessees that provide additional guidance to clarify how operators must comply with existing regulations. We have clarified that operators must have a well-specific blowout and worst-case discharge scenario that provides the assumptions and calculations behind those scenarios. We have clarified that operators must certify that they will conduct their drilling operations in compliance with all applicable agency regulations, including the new drilling safety rule. And we have clarified that we will assess whether each operator has submitted adequate information to demonstrate that it has access to and can deploy subsea containment resources sufficient to respond to a deep water blowout. In addition to our enhancing drilling and workplace safety, we have focused much of our attention on the reorganization of the former MMS into independent entities with distinct missions. These missions are leasing and energy development, the regulation of offshore drilling, and the collection of revenues from Federal energy development. Having these three conflicting functions reside within the same Bureau enhance the potential for internal conflicts of interest among the objectives of the agency. Instead of one agency with multiple and conflicting missions, we will have three new ent entities, as Mr. Rusco has just described. They are BOEM, uh, BSEE, and uh, Honor. We are on track to complete the reorganization by October 1 of this year. BOMER continues to facilitate domestic exploration by issuing permits. We have continued to issue shallow water permits in every case where the application complies with the heightened standards that apply to shallow water operations. To date, 55 new shallow water well permits have been issued since last June when new safety and environmental standards went into effect. Just seven of these permits are currently pending, with seven having been returned to the operator for more information. Deep water drilling applications fall into two categories. First, there are deep water permits that involve act activities that were barred by the deep water drilling moratorium. We have approved 40 of these permits for 15 unique wells since industry demonstrated in mid-February that it had developed subsea containment capabilities. 25 permits are pending and 20 permits have been returned to the operator. Second, there is a category that is frequently ignored in discussions, deep water activities not barred under the moratorium, including water injection wells, completions and workovers. Since the implementation of new safety and environmental standards, 40 of these permits have been approved. Only one is currently pending. Although our permitting of drilling activities has been moving ahead steadily over the past three months, there are good reasons why the pace is somewhat slower than in the past. Our new regulations have required operators to make sure their applications fully comply with the new requirements. In addition, our drilling engineers have had to work to ensure compliance with the expanded set of requirements. This process may have proved frustrating to some in the industry, but the additional rules and heightened scrutiny are completely appropriate and in the best interests of this nation. In closing, Mr. Chairman, we have made significant strides in reforming the way offshore oil and gas program is carried out 
at the Department of the Interior and on the Outer Continental Shelf. We have raised standards and promoted safety and science in offshore oil and gas operations. And because of the hard work of industry and people in Boehmer, we have been approving and issuing plans and permits and getting people back to work. That concludes my statement, and I am happy to answer any questions you or the other members may have. Thank you, sir, and thank all of you. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenholt, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, and I would like to, first, the uh, members from uh, industry on our panel, I would like to thank you guys for coming up and sharing your thoughts and concerns. I hope you will excuse me if I ignore you and uh, talk to the government regulator that I think it may be giving you some of the problems. Um, so if I could uh, ask a couple of, Mr. Bromwich, you went through a, a lot of numbers here pretty quick, and I just wanted to make sure I got an adequate handle on those and talked a little bit about the pace that we are uh, that, that we're looking at. Uh, so there have been permits, you said there have been permits on 15 uh, projects that uh, have been issued since the moratorium was ended. Is that the correct there number? There are four deep water wells for activities that were prohibited under the moratorium. We have permitted 15 unique wells. The 15th was yesterday. And, and, now, there are multiple permits frequently for right. individual unique wells, which leads to the larger number. And, and, and of that 15, how many of them were in the process before the moratorium went into effect? Well, it depends what you mean by, by in the process. Could you clarify what you mean? I would, that had filed the application that, they, that y'all had been working on and just you know, stuck on the shelf. Or, or, or well, we hadn't stuck any on the shelf. A number of the projects were ongoing. They were stopped by the moratorium, and then applications had to be resubmitted to make sure that they complied with new enhanced safety regulations. Right. So the, the number I have, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is um, there are about uh, four or five that are actually new ones that weren't resubmitted or ho however you want to that weren't already in the works prior to the moratorium. That is about right. I think the number actually may be slower, but those are still projects that are ongoing that put people back to work. So the distinction right. between projects that had been previously submitted and new projects right. is really quite irrelevant. And, and so how long are we looking at, if I wanted to, if I had gotten a lease and wanted to drill a well, how long under the current process would, would it typically take, assuming I am reasonable about my paperwork? Well, that is a, a big assumption. One of the challenges <laughs> that we have seen that industry has faced, and they fully acknowledge this, uh, is that they have frequently submitted both plans that are incomplete and noncompliant and permit applications that are incomplete and noncompliant. We are working with industry every day to try to eliminate the, the number of times that we have to return either plans or permits so that we can process them straight on through and approve them. But really, is this a result of the fact there are so many new regulations that you all aren't even completely sure what needs to be done? That, the complaint I am hearing from well, the, my, my friends in the industry, I am from Corpus Christi, Texas, it is pretty big in Gulf drilling, mm -hmm. it is that they don't even know what they need to do to satisfy uh, your criteria. I mean, I understand there are some growing pains, but I mean, these things were getting out in two weeks. Prior to, prior to the Deepwater Horizon? Before the new enhanced safety or environmental regulations. That is right. They were being churned out quickly, and the new safety and environmental rules makes the process move a little okay. more slowly. So are we talking now two months, six months? I mean, if you have only got four new ones since February, it seems like we are looking at much longer. I, I, well, I can tell you, Congressman Farenthold, that if a fully compliant exploration plan was submitted, and then a fully compliant APD, an application to drill, was submitted, we are talking about a few weeks, not a large number of months. And that has not so far been our experience so far. But I take issue with your suggestion that industry doesn't ex understand what the requirements are, because I think they do. I think they didn't fully understand them at the beginning. I think they do now. And if you talk to them today, I think they would acknowledge that. W would the gentleman yield? I, I will. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Would you say that months ago when the moratorium officially was lifted, that you had full and complete guidance available to those oil companies on that day? No, I don't think we had full and complete guidance. But let me make something clear, Mr. Okay, that is all I really wanted, because I, I, yeah, I, well, I do want to reclaim oh, but my the, time. The new rules that I focused on in my opening statement were issued October 15th, so three days after the moratorium was lifted. And that is what began uh, the adjustment time and cost both for industry and to some extent for us. So I just wanted to clarify the timeline. 
And then what is happening with the 33 previously permitted deep water wells? Well, we don't track them that way, Congressman. A number of them have not resubmitted their applications, and we obviously can't do anything about that. We can only act on the applications that we have So, so uh, they, they were permitted, the rules changed, you moved the goalpost, and they have to start over again. No, that is not the way I would put it at all. Uh, one, of the, 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 one of the main obstacles to companies getting their permits approved is the fact that they now have to demonstrate uh, access to and the ability to deploy containment. I don't think you or I want anybody drilling in deep water that can't show that. Well, I, I, I'm out of time, so I'll, uh, if we get to another round of questions, I do have a couple more. So thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Maryland, ranking member, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The um, Director, first of all, thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, it has been extremely helpful. Um, one of the things that I say to my constituents is that uh, w this is our watch. We are on the earth now, and we have a duty to pass on, pass on a better environment than the one we found when we came upon this earth. And I truly believe that. And Director Brumwich, um, you know, I was listening to um, Governor Barber, and he said something that was very interesting. Um, when I asked him about uh, this, uh, the Department of Interior drilling permit requirement, and it is called NTL uh, 2010 N10. And what it says is that, it, and it was talking about the, the moratorium, and it said it has to, it, it, the, the, these companies, that they, they, they have to show that they, it has access to and can deploy surface and subsea containment resources that would be adequate to promptly respond to a blowout. And, you know, it is interesting that and I, it kind of surprised me when Governor Barber said that he felt that the risk, the risk of what happened with Deepwater Water Horizon was worth it when he considered the cost. And I understand, believe me, I sympathize with, with people being out of work. As a matter of fact, I have done everything I know how to try to make sure they get compensated. But Tell me, what, what was your, do you have an opinion on that based upon what you have been doing in the administration? Yes, I do. I actually would like to take issue with something else Governor Barber said, which was that the Deepwater Horizon blowout was the first event of its kind or anything close to it in the history of deepwater drilling. The President's Commission says that that is not so. They cite 79 incidents of loss of well control, which is what Macondo was loss of well control between 1996 and 2009. So another way to uh, describe that is 79 near misses, 79 almost deep water horizons. So without going into the details of each one, that is what the President's Commission found. So to say that the risk is one in a million or one in X thousand of deep water wells drilled, uh, it is not accurate. Now, we will never be able to reduce the risk to zero. We know that and you know that. But we have to work constructively to try to diminish those risks in a balanced way so that we don't uh, impose uh, inappropriately high costs on industry and yet we do raise the bar on safety. We have done that. Uh, so I think we have lowered the risk. And my risk threshold may be different from Governor Barber's because I would not have been comfortable going forward without the strengthening of the safety rules that we have put into place. And let me ask you this. The administration also put in place a requirement that all companies have a formal contract to call on, on that service if service is needed. Let me quote uh, the new requirement. Uh, it says, Bomer will evaluate whether each operator has submitted adequate information demonstrating that it has access to and can deploy surface and subsea containment resources that would be adequately to, prompt, to promptly uh, deal with the blowout. Now, let me ask you this. Can you explain in layman's terms why you now require all companies to demonstrate that they can respond to deep water blowouts before new permits are issued? For the very reason that I think you and other members said in the questioning of Governor Barber, I think we were all sickened by the fact that for 87 days the oil flowed into the Gulf with 
uh, the trial and error process that was used to try to cap the well. And finally, after 87 days, uh, it was capped. We don't want that to ever happen again. We want industry to be prepared. And in a way, talking about the period of the moratorium is a false issue, because the fact is the containment requirement is critically important, and industry admits it was not ready with containment until the middle of February of this year. Now, you say in your testimony that, <clears throat> that uh, the temporary moratorium on deep water drilling was lifted in October of last year, but you didn't issue the first deep water drilling permit until February. Why is that? Because there were not the containment systems and resources that were ready until the middle of February. Uh, in the first panel, we talked about the Marine Well Containment Company. There is another group, the Helix Well Containment Group. But neither of those groups was ready, had had its equipment, had tested its equipment until the middle of February of this year. I see my time has expired. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from New Hampshire for five minutes, Mr. Gunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bromwich, I just have one question for you, and then I want to get to some of the other panelists. Um, in, in considering uh, the, the plans or permits, do, how much do you look at the economic impact and, and the loss of economic in activity in considering uh, the process by which your agency goes through? Well, the individual plans and permits are reviewed by our field personnel in the Gulf of Mexico. I have absolutely no role in that. And I don't think it would be appropriate for them to scrutinize plan applications or permit applications for any other reason other than to determine whether they are complying with all applicable regulations. So they do not and they should not. So they, they do not consider the economic impact? They do not and they shouldn't. Okay. Somebody who is inspecting plans and permits uh, should not do that. Uh, I want to move to Mr. Keefe. Thank you uh, as well for coming. Can you just describe to me um, very, very quickly the type of company you have and then the, and then the average employee that you have, the kind of individual that you, that, uh, that you represent? We are in the tugboat business, so we move drilling rigs for a living. And, uh, I would say 80 percent of our employees are, are, are sailors, ordinary seamen, engineers, captains, mates, and the rest of uh, the tw other 20 percent are, are staff, you know, from uh, maintenance people to personnel and administration. How many, how many people employed? Uh, approximately 110. And have, has that number changed since the moratorium? Well, as I stated, we, we've had few layoffs, but we've had to adjust wages on, on our em employees, and, and you know, we have thresholds that we're meeting where we know that we're going to have to lay off people in top equipment. So you've also, not only are you going to have to lay off people in the future, but you've reduced salaries? Yes, sir. For almost everyone in the company? For about 50 percent of the About 50 percent. These are families that depend on that, that source of income? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, three of the companies we have, uh, the, the, this, this company, Offshore Towing, is a partnership of three companies. W one of them was actually founded by my grandfather, and uh, my aunt actually owns it now, and her daughters, and I, I run that company as well. I assume it is safe to say that you would like to see uh, the, the, the economy grow, come back as quick as possible, and you would like to see uh, the government participate in a, in a positive way to make that happen? Yes, I would. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Tafaro, thank you for being here. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the economic impact. I, I, it seems to me here in Washington uh, we are so focused on the regulatory side of this, and there is good reason to be concerned about the regulatory environment. I don't think anybody disagrees that we want to have uh, safety. We want to make sure that this never happens again. Uh, I don't think that that's a partisan issue. I think that's, that's just that that's, makes sense, good, good public policy. My concern is with the thousands of people who are negatively impacted for the long term in the decisions that have been made uh, by this administration. And my heart goes out to each and every individual who no longer has a job or is waiting desperately to have the possibility 
of getting back to work. And I, I believe that we ought to consider that as we move forward in just about every public policy decision that we do. Now, it doesn't mean that you provide uh, a permit if it's not appropriate. It doesn't mean that you provide a, a permit to someone who is not capable of handling it. But I do think that we have a responsibility to consider the, uh, the negative impacts that have occurred to regular, everyday people who are desperately looking for employment. Could you just talk a little bit about um, how that is impacting the people that you are representing? Well, the, the, the main issue, I, th I think, is that uh, we have to keep in mind that part of what happens is there is a trickle-down effect, uh, a rig not being permitted or drill, a drill operation not being permitted doesn't just affect those men and women who work the rig. It affects uh, every other spinoff company and agency that provides support for those businesses or for that operation. Uh, that is where we really feel the effects um, in St. Bernard Parish and along the entire coastal Louisiana and beyond, as you have as heard. The, the main issue that we want to make sure is that the comprehensive impact is reviewed. While we want safety, and certainly we don't want to have another impact uh, or another disaster such as the one that we experienced just over a year ago, uh, we definitely don't want to uh, exacerbate uh, that call to safety by undermining the economics of our, of our region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Mr. Clay. For five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank the witnesses for being here. Uh, people who have long um, been concerned about the public welfare have raised some important questions about the aftermath of the BP oil spill disaster. Uh, some disturbing information has come to light regarding money spent during efforts to recover from the spill. Uh, for example, from my hometown, uh, Mr. Dick Gregory, who is here today, he and others have brought to my attention some investigative articles written by ProPublica and The Washington Post. These articles are worrying. They allege that there are some who profited from the BP oil spill disaster. These people apparently game the system to take so much money inappropriately that they earn the nickname Spillionaires. Two of those who are named in these investigative articles are here testifying today on this panel. Now, as a politician, I know, that I know what it is like to read a newspaper article about issues with which I am, I am involved. I have had the experience of reading articles where I cannot recognize the events as they have been described by the reporters. So I know how it can be sometimes for others in similar circumstances, and we don't always have an opportunity to respond to those articles and perhaps set the record straight. Uh, therefore, I feel duty-bound, Mr. Tafaro and Mr. Williams to give you the opportunity here today to respond to those articles and to what they have alleged about your conduct in the wake of the BP oil spill disaster. Uh, Mr. Tafaro, would you like to take a stab at it? Sure, Congressman. I will be glad to. If you could give me a specific question, I will be glad to answer it. Sure. Uh, in, in, in both articles, the, the Washington Post and ProPublica, uh, they talk about uh, hand-picked contractors. They talk about uh, uh, you uh, uh, taking a um, uh, implementing a uh, a thirty-day emergency, uh, which allowed you to pick contractors outside of normal government procedure. Uh, one contractor was given, um, was renting, was leasing land at $1,700 a month and happened to lease the land back to BP for $1.1 million a month. Uh, was that, is that accurate? Well, I would be glad to respond to that. Uh, and 
Mr. Congressman, I would— uh, The gentleman will suspend. The, you're, you're under oath. You're, requ you're, not re you're required to speak truthfully. You are not required to ask que answer questions outside the scope of this hearing. So you, glad you, may to you may choose to answer, but that would be true of any of our witnesses, is that if, if something is outside the scope and the meaning of this hearing, including, quite frankly, any impugning of individuals who came here to testify, there is no obligation uh, to respond. But the gentleman— I will be glad to. And, and unfortunately, this is exactly the concern that, that has been raised and is raised again, that, uh, excuse my, my frankness, a hatchet job by Ms. Barker, who had no— and if I, I think if your staff re researches that information, has no factual data to compensate or to, to substantiate your comments. The idea is we were under a state of, of emergency. I did declare a disaster. I think everyone who had a, any involvement in the process would certainly see that as justifiable. As far as handing out contracts, St. Bernard Parish government me as the elected, chief elected official, signed one contract regarding the uh, operations of the BP oil spill disaster. And that was the one to the company owned by the St. Bernard Parish Sheriff? That is not, that's not accurate, Mr. Congressman. Who charged more than $1 million a month for land it had been leasing for I think what you, what, you point out, what you point out is exactly the problem with the way the operations were run. BP executives uh, authorized representatives on the ground with BP to initiate and negotiate land deals, vendor agreements, um, use of resources, and then change those personnel out, and then didn't pay them what they were owed. That is a, that is a true economic impact of what we have going on how about, continuously. How about the selection of of certain fishermen to, to do to help with the cleanup and then some getting picked, some didn't didn't get picked. What was the criteria there? Every selection process that we used to employ the exact individuals who were impacted by the spill, whose livelihoods overnight were ripped from them, sure. whose generational cultural identity overnight was ripped from them. Every selection process that was implemented was done in a public forum and was continuously reviewed and modified to make sure that those individuals who were most impacted were those people who were being put to work to respond to the disaster of no doing of their own. Thank you for uh, your response. Right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, your Chairman ask uh, Mr. Williams. Yes, your, your time has expired. Mr. Williams, you may respond. Yeah. Congressman, I appreciate that question, and I think it is very critical. As Mr. Faro indicated, I come from a county in northwest Florida that has less than 20,000 people. Um, we are a very small county. We have an operating budget on a millage based on $9 million. You are going to run into family folks. I felt like, and certainly I am glad that we are here in an office of, of uh, oversight and reform, because I, and personally, not that I take offense, I appreciate the question. But I feel like it is a red herring for the issues that we are here to address today. We were under a tremendous amount of pressure. I have two people in my emergency management department, two. We had no resources from the State. We had no guidance from the Federal Government. We were put under tremendous strain. And the article that you are referring to, the, the author of that, never came to my county, never stepped foot in our county. What you are indicating there is that a girlfriend worked as a public information officer and she had volunteered through that period of time tremendously through the process. So I think, my, with all due respect, sir, my scenario would be you have to understand that I am proud of what we did, trying to put people to work together, amassing what we had, basically a militia of people who were trying to fight what was coming on our shores. And so I appreciate the question, but I think it is very misleading to the ultimate goal that I would like to do and present for, from the Federal Government what you can do to help me at the local level. Well, uh, and I am glad that you, have, that you both have responded in the way you have. And Thank I you. Appreciate uh, just for the record, did your Ethics Board clear that action? 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. To, actually, before uh, that was done, the Board of County Commissioners did not approve any of the contracts, as my colleague indicated. This was done primarily through our county administrator. However, we went through our legal counsel. We went to the State of Florida's Ethics Commission. We also went to the Governor's Task Force that was guiding that and asked for permission ahead of time to make sure that it was there. So I feel like the media certainly exploited this scenario to make it look bad for a lot of folks who were doing the best they could and being proud to work for their communities. But yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you giving the opportunity because I was ahead of time. We did it right. We stopped profiteering. We went, I served on the Governor's Task Force. We went through and we saw companies coming in and asking for several hundred thousands of dollars to man some of these small counties. We refused to do that. We turned and asked the Governor for assistance, and, and through the uh, Department of Emergency Management, we worked under the guidelines and under the premises, and we did the best we could under the circumstances. Thank you for your response. I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, I am just old enough to remember, uh, I guess, the 60s in some cases, but Mark McCormick, who was a prolific writer, wrote, among other things, uh, the terrible truth about lawyers and uh, you know, what they don't teach you at the Harvard Business School. And uh, I don't take away every quote from all those books, but I take away one, which is that a problem is something money can't solve. Mr. Bromowicz, if money was not the problem, and I presume money was available, whether it's the $20 billion from uh, BP, the billion dollars from the industry to form a quick response, uh, for future potential spills, et cetera, why did it take you not just the six months of the moratorium, but essentially another many, many months of permatorium before you had guidance so that we could begin having oil wells, uh, new oil wells drilled again and permitted? Mr. Chairman, I think it is fair to say that um, Deepwater Horizon was an earthquake through the industry, they acknowledge that, and through the government. No, we, I, I, we, please, we, we please, please we answer my that. question. I am answering your question. Well, no, no let's, let's put it in perspective. Your agency's inspectors went on a rig that had not one but two battery packs not active, uh, an oil well that you mentioned the 79. This thing had had repeated missteps. This, was, this oil well was like a drunken driver swerving, crossing the line repeatedly, and MMS did nothing to do it. MMS had a study back in 2003 that questioned the, blow, the bypass or blowoff preventers, uh, but did nothing but say, pick one. All of these things had occurred prior to that date. So was it an earthquake in your organization or was it an earthquake to the oil industry? The oil industry has made it pretty clear that BP was a bad actor on this well and a bad actor in the Gulf, but that, in fact, there was a reason that their actions were not consistent with other drillers in the, in the Gulf. So which, which earthquake was it? Was it an earthquake within the oil drilling industry or an earthquake within your agency? Both. And as the President's Commission notes, it is inappropriate to single out BP as the only bad actor here. That report, which is based on a thorough investigation, pointed out uh, that Halliburton was at fault and that Transocean was at fault. And as you know, Halliburton and Transocean do work and are involved in providing services in a huge percentage of deep water wells I, that have I been hear drilled you, Mr. in the Gulf. But isn't it true? Well, actually, I'll go to uh, Mr. Uh, Rusko. Isn't it true that the reorganization is as much at fault for the delay in the ability to get America working again in the Gulf? Isn't that what the GAO study finds? Is that this is a distracted agency because it's reorganizing? I think it's a it's a complicating factor. I I I can't say that it's caused the delays. I I I take Mr. Bromwich's point that once they decided that that companies needed to uh, demonstrate the ability to contain a blowout, that that was the the binding constraint until until that. And when was, was that? When was that request made? When was the starting date for that? Um, I'm going to have to defer to Mr. Bromwich. Mr. Bromwich, when was the starting date for the blowoff preventer uh, demonstration requirement that they could contain if the, if the blowoff preventer? Two different things, Mr. Chairman. Blowout preventer, additional rules. If, if, if it failed, if the blowoff preventer failed, containment, 
when did you say they must prove they can contain, even we, if we that We clarified what we think had been clear to many, but we clarified it in writing on November 8th. November 8th? Yes. How long was that after the uh, moratorium began? Less than a month. I mean, uh, before, after it began? Yes. It, the first moratorium was put in place, I believe, in May, so several, okay. several months after. So you have a six-month moratorium, then a month after that moratorium is over, basically, then you say you have to do that. Isn't this a second, isn't this taking six, seven months to decide that you are going to add one more way to stop the oil industry from starting again? Wasn't that reckless to go seven months and discover, or six months and discover that you had missed something as basic as that? No, I don't think it was reckless, and I don't think we— Well, how did it get, over, think, did it get missed we, for six I don't months? Think, well, nobody said it was missed other than you. Well, I'm saying it wasn't missed. The, why wasn't it asked on the day industry, one? The industry, as you know, Mr. Chairman, formed the Marine Well Containment Company in July, so they knew at that point that that was going to be an obstacle to getting deep water permits until they could put together the resources. So it took them, and then it took later Helix, a number of months, close to seven months, from the time they recognized that it needed to be done, uh, and they announced it until they were ready to go. The mere fact that we clarified what was required in November didn't start any clock and doesn't, doesn't reflect any recklessness at all. Mr. Bromwitz, are you still clarifying various things for the industry? Of course. That's what a regulator does. So when will it be clear? I think it's clear to 95 percent of the operators now. The other 5 percent come forward and ask, our que ask questions of us. We'll clarify it for them. We meet all the time, Mr. Chairman, with operators. We met this week with a group of Gulf area operators, uh, a delegation headed by Director of Natural Resources for Louisiana, Scott Angel. They have been a forum for asking questions, asking for clarification, and getting them. Okay. The, uh, Mr. Keefe, I, I, I'm sorry that we really can't do more for you today, but we are not going to give up on this on any of your, your testimony here today. Mr. Bromwich, you said you would take something back if it was outside of the mainstream. I want to make sure you take this back today. There is pending lit litigation, or there is current litigation, in the Eastern District of Louisiana challenging seismic surveys in the Gulf of Mexico by the, the infamous NRDC versus Salazar. Our information is that the Secretary has, in fact, worked out to stay that case and is discussing settlements. The question for the Department of Interior is, if you settle one more time with a radical environmental group that sues and then gets settlements leading to regulatory changes or areas off limits, don't you have a conflict of interest? In fact, shouldn't this case be a case in which those with a vested interest, the states and the oil companies, should have a seat at the table rather than having a settlement issued around what they would call their interest, along with the gentleman here today. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't need to like. take that one back because I'm, in, I'm involved in that matter. And so, in fact, so, first of all, I think the characterization of NRDC as a radical environmental organization they sue is, is, at not, will is not endlessly. accurate. But, but, but secondly, um, we have to make litigation judgments, the Solicitor's Office has to make lit litigation judgments about whether to settle cases or, or not, without going into the details of the settlement discussions. Uh, there are settlement discussions ongoing, and I will tell you that one of the goals of su such settlement discussions is to prevent more radical uh, injunctions or actions being taken by uh, the court. With respect to the involvement of the oil companies, they are interveners in that case, so they have a seat at the table. But they are locked out if, they, if you settle. And in fact, the NRDC has on their website their litigation motive and method as part of their fundamental way of doing business. So you may not consider them radical, but an organization that basically litigates in order to legislate and an agency that settles in order to effectively create legislation is exactly what this committee is concerned about. So you may not consider them radical. You may not consider your settlement around the interveners as, in fact, somehow un-American or that you have a conflict. But this, this organization here is finding that conflict more and more consistent. I want to thank you all for your oops, I want to thank you all for your continued testimony. We now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes. I thank, I thank the chairman and, uh, and uh, I thank the witnesses uh, for being here today. And uh, uh, Mr. Bromwich, um, 
We have got a question about the marine archaeologist uh, rule, the, the new rule uh, that uh, your organization has promulgated. Um, is, so is it true that operators will, will have to employ a marine archaeologist in order to comply with this? Is this it true they have to what? Pardon me? Is it true they have to what? I could, didn't hear what you said. Oh, okay. I will repeat what I said. In context of the new archaeological assessment report, um, is it true that operators will have to employ a marine archaeologist to comply with this rule? They will have to have the survey conducted, whether it is by hiring somebody, contracting with someone or whatever. We don't, we don't mandate that, but they will have to do an archaeological survey, yes. And why is that necessary? Why is that necessary? It is because a number of discoveries have been made in recent years of shipwrecks and other structures that are protected by various Federal laws, including the National Environmental Policy Act. And as we have eliminated um, the categorical exclusions with which you used to do exploration plans and now are doing uh, environmental assessments, site-specific environmental assessments, the way the process works is we have different subject matter experts who have to look at the issues. And our archaeologists, subject matter experts, will simply not sign off on an exploration plan without that kind of a survey. Okay. So that is the reason. Okay. Well, so in terms of what your organization does, does, does that have anything to do with safety? It has to do with protecting the environment, which is part of our mandate. Okay. All right. It, was there a cost-benefit analysis uh, in, in context with this regulation? I am not, I'm not sure whether there was or there wasn't. Okay. What, would, you, would you be willing to follow up with the committee and sure. uh, give us your assessment of the cost and benefits of this regulation? I would be happy to. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, thank you for being here today. It is uh, certainly an interesting process to testify before Congress. But uh, in, in context with, with your experience, there is a difference between the OPA and the Stafford Act in terms of uh, responsibilities and uh, everything else. Do you think that operating under OPA uh, was uh, reasonable, proper, good? Was it a better outcome than operating under Stafford? Uh, we turn on your mic. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, sir. It, it actually paralyzed us at the local level. Um, I think some components of OPA, and we're not trying to basically supplant, uh, supplant OPA with the Stafford Act. But we are trained, particularly in the State of Florida, we have test modeled, we have put everything through over and over case studies, and because we are so impacted by our storms, um, we were unable at the local level to make decisions firsthand. It has always been at the local level and worked that up. Um, under the unified command, the responsible party hijacked the entire process. Um, we were basically at, at their mercy, their decision making. We were disconnected from our State partners and, I believe, from our Federal partners in the process. Um, we actually called it unidentified command. We would wait for weeks and wait in weeks trying to get things done. We wasted incredible amounts of time looking at boom strategies and national contingency plans and area contingency plans that were extremely dysfunctional. They were antiquated. There was no span of control. There was no unified command. The State of Florida in my area in the Panhandle was being controlled from Mobile. Um, it was a breakdown, uh, as the Governor indicated earlier, from communications and processes, the methodologies. It was completely broken. So to answer your question emphatically, no. OPA did not work on the ground level. It did not work at the State level, and I think it failed the, the folks in our country. So this was a management problem? Yes, sir. Clearly? Yes, sir. And your experience with storms is what? Primarily living in Florida, and I guess growing up originally, I was uh, started, I guess, when I was four in Camille uh, in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, with Florida, I've been elected since 2004 and 2005. You know the history where we cr crisscrossed our state with four hurricanes in one year, uh, heavy, heavy damage. And as an elected official, I have watched a masterful process. And obviously, Florida, I think, is mastered. Mr. Fugate now being head of FEMA, coming from Florida. We know how to do it at the ground level. We make good decisions. We work with our emergency management partners. We work with our state partners to make those critical online decisions. This process was dysfunctional and broken. And Stafford is clearly better? 
Yes, sir. It gives the local government the ability to pull on the resources as necessary, but to make on-the-ground on field decisions that we can implement immediately. We had to go through an approval process. To, to give you a very poor analogy, it's like, go ask your mom, go ask your dad. I, and I never could get a straight answer. It is a, it is a system that I think this, this group, particularly in, in Congress, has to look at. There are lessons in homeland security. There are lessons, as the governor indicated earlier, if we drill off of, of Cuba, China, et cetera, you know, as bad as the responsible party scenario was without a responsible party, where would we be? Multi-jurisdictional lines and centralized command has to be charged. One point I would like to, to make, I came a few months ago during the National Association of Counties and met with intergovernmental affairs and requested the ability for intergovernmental affairs from the administration to work with the directors of emergency management within the five affected states so that we could go back and look at case examples and studies and what can we do better. That, I think, is very critical, and I would ask that the chairman and this commission review that so we can get down to our emergency management people at the state level and to our county level so this never happens again. Thank you, I, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We are not going to do a second round, but there will be just a couple of quick comments, one from the gentleman from Texas and then one from the ranking member. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I did want to just, uh, do you, uh, to Mr. Romich, do you think that what is going on now in, in the increased permitting process and the time involved is driving up the price of gasoline at the pump? No, I don't. You don't think there is a concerted effort going on to, to do that with the slowdown in Gulf of Mexico, which is a quarter of our domestic supply. Concerted, EPA, effort, concerted effort by whom? I, I, I think this administration, I am typically not a black helicopters guy, but if you look at what is going on, if I were a speculator, I would be buying oil futures. We have got the slowdown in the Gulf. We have got a slowdown of land leases. We have got the EPA talking about fracking uh, regulations. We have got the sage lizard, which is another quarter of the production in the Permian Basin of Texas. It is like we are trying to run these gas prices up. Well, I, I can speak for the issues that I am aware of, which is offshore. There is no such effort. There has never been any such effort. Would the gentleman yield for a second? Yes, please. If the gentleman could respond to the MMS uh, finding up on the board, which we cited earlier, that might clarify it, since MMS found that there was a correlation between a reduction in the Gulf and increase in price. That is your Chairman, own study. I have never, never seen that before. I don't like to comment on things that I have just been introduced to. I have, I have read in recent weeks a lot of very knowledgeable commentators, including economists, who say it is a world market and a minor, a relatively minor slowdown in permitting here has virtually no impact on prices. In addition to that, as you know, okay, uh, there has this, been no, the there's been no cessation or delays in production. Uh, yeah, production wanna... has continued all along. There was never a moratorium on production. I do want to just claim, reclaim my time for a second. Historically speaking, you actually see a spike in the p price of oil, whether it is driven by speculators or the market, even when there is a hurricane that is delaying production in the Gulf just over a couple of days. How can you rationally say that a long-term slowdown in the permitting process isn't going to affect the price of oil? Well, because I don't, well, you asked me whether it was, it was uh, okay. causing a, a rise in the price of oil now. My understanding of world market conditions is that uh, the production has continued apace, that the projections for declining production uh, are not for the present, they are for the future. Uh, and therefore, I thought the question was about the present, and I don't think it's having an effect at present. And just real, real quickly, I mean, we. There have been reports, you know, we have had record oil production in 2010. Do you, do you think domestic production, do you think that record is going to continue through 2012 as we start to see the results of some of these changes in policies? Well, the EIA, which is the considered uh, <clears throat> the most reliable sources of energy production, does predict a decline in 2011 and in 2012. I don't have a crystal ball, but I am not in a position and, and, to dispute and, that. So a decrease in production, typical under supply and demand, would probably re re result in an increase in price of oil and corollary of price of gasoline at the pump. Well, but that presumes that we only have a domestic market, which we don't. All right. Thank you very much. Another oh, on the first panel. Uh, we have been joined, uh, I thank the gentleman, uh, we have been joined, uh, oh, wait a second, Can, would the gentleman yield for just a second from his time? Yes, sir. Uh, I, Mr. Bromwich, I would just like you to, uh, we will give you a copy of it, but since that study that said there would be a rise based on uh, a lesser reduction in the Gulf than actually occurred or is occurring, that was, that was delivered under our 
discovery request from your organization. You gave it to us. So hopefully you will take it back, look at the information that we received pursuant to our request from you, and figure out whether or not you should have seen that document before your agency allowed well, you to, to come here. Just to be here. clear, Mr. Chairman, I don't review every document that you ask for and receive, just to be clear. Right. But I, I understand. But uh, this, since this one said just the opposite of what Mr. Hayes said and what you are saying, I think it is a good one for you to review. And you can comment back about happy. whether you think it was accurate since it was an internal document. Happy to do it. And we have been, we've been joined again by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I have another hearing at Foreign Affairs, so that is why I have been going back and forth, and I thank the Chair's indulgence. Mr. Brumwich, um, during the first panel, uh, you probably heard what I heard Governor Barber state, that simply enforcing existing rules would prevent future oil spills. When the National Commission on the Gulf Oil Spill issued its report, did it say that simply enforcing existing regulations would be sufficient? No. What did it say? It pointed to a series of contributing causes uh, to the oil spill, uh, a variety of primarily human errors uh, committed by personnel from BP, Transocean, Halliburton, and so forth. And, and it specifically said uh, that, I believe, as I recall, that, that enforcement of existing regulations would not have prevented it. Would not have? Would not have prevented the oil spill. Are there improvements in the enforcement or in the regulatory framework itself? Uh, that uh, could be helpful? Yes, and we have already taken many of those steps. Our drilling safety rule, which is addressed to well design, well casing, cementing, and blow up preventers, we think substantially reduces the risks uh, of another spill like Deepwater Horizon. As I said before, I am not sure you were here, we will never be able to reduce it to zero. We won't. Uh, but we have reduced it already substantially. And I think over time, as industry wants to go into deeper and deeper water and the regulatory process uh, needs to keep up, I hope that we can further reduce that risk. But it will never be reduced to zero. Um, one of the arguments made by Governor Barber and others is that you got 31,000 oil rigs, uh, the safety record is fine, we, you know, once in a while, one bad apple shouldn't uh, cause us to turn everything on its head. Um, my point to Governor Barber was, well, but one blowout of this magnitude is pretty significant, and can we really, shouldn't we be doing everything on our part to try to minimize that ever happening? Um, and the fact that it happens once is once too many, given the severity and magnitude of the, of the disaster. What is the view uh, of the administration with respect to sort of rolling the dice and taking our chances on a blowout? Well, we don't want to roll the dice and take uh, a chance on a major blowout. Again, the risk will never be reduced to zero, but we think we can do and have already done many common sense things to reduce that risk. And further, I am not sure whether you were here at the time, uh, but this is not unprecedented in the sense of losses of well control that nearly led to blowouts. This was the only actual blowout, but the President's Commission found that there were 79 instances of loss of well control between 1996 and 2009. So another way to put it is 79 almost Deepwater Horizons. So the idea that this is a unique event and really apparently an act of God or something like that is, is misleading. Well, thankfully, it was unique in terms of the fact that the well totally blew and you had 4.9 million barrels of oil spill into the Gulf. But in terms of the problems that arise, particularly in deep water with high pressures and so on, uh, no, it is not so far out of the norm that it, it, uh, it begs to be dismissed. One of the things that the uh, Obama administration did that some might view as prudent after such a high magnitude uh, accident was a temporary moratorium on, per, on, on additional permitting until uh, we had our arms around the causes and the prevention and so forth. It, it, in listening to some of the rhetoric and even reading some signs uh, we seem to favor around here, one would have the impression that moratorium has led to a significant plummet 
in domestic production. Is that the case? No, it's had no impact on production because production was never stopped or delayed. Is it not true, as a matter of fact, that domestic oil production in the Obama administration is actually higher than that of the Bush administration? Yes. In two th as of the end of 2010, that is exactly right. And is it also true that applications for permits to drill actually increased in the Obama administration over the Bush administration? I believe that is right. Hmm. Um, and is it also true that production on outer continental shelf actually also increased under the Obama administration over the Bush administration? It has. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we have had a vote called on the floor, and so with that, I want to thank all of our witnesses for your generosity of your time. The record will remain open for an additional week to allow you to add additional information, plus opening statements of members on the dais who were not able to be here. With that, we stand adjourned.